Grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a response and conversation video on our second lesson from our ongoing class on Luther's small catechism. Last week, last week, two days ago, we talked about the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. And we uh, are looking back and answering some of the questions that came in, some of the comments that came in about that commandment. If you are joining us on YouTube, you'll be able to just search Tomorrow River Lutheran Parish and you'll be able to find all of our uh, different videos. Uh, if you are on the website, it should be on this same page where you are. And so uh, you can look back and you can see what what we talked about there and add your own commentary if you would like. So one person wrote in and, and one of the things I talked about was that it's possible to make anything into a God. Luther said that, that your God is whatever you trust to bring you all good things and whatever you trust to protect you uh, from harm, that's your God. And it can be money, it can be position, it can be education, it can be standing. For Lutherans, we're particularly aware that it can be our own sense of holiness that we trust finally in our own righteousness, our own goodness uh, to, uh, to stand us in good stead on the last day. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is a problem since we are all fallen. We are all sinners, right? So this person wrote in, totally trusting in a spouse or a family member would qualify as using them as an idol. I quite agree with that. Uh, but doesn't it also place you when they fail your trust, because they are only human after all, in a position of playing at being God? See, that's, that's the other side, right? That, that not only are we tempted to make of ourself an idol when we list our own positions, we're tempted to make of ourselves a God or an idol when we presume to judge one another. It's exactly right what this person says. Of course it can. Of course it can do that. When you are partnered with someone and they fail you and they will, and they will, you have a couple of choices. You can judge them or you can discern that their behavior doesn't measure up to the standard that they have claimed for themselves or that you as a couple have claimed for your union, you discern that there's a problem. That's a totally different thing than condemning the other person, and judging the other person. And when you discern that there's a problem, again, you have a couple of choices. You can condemn them for failing to live up to their standards or the standards of the union, or you can go to work in gentleness and in grace, praying for them, encouraging them, confronting them, but with a heart of grace to try to bring this person back to their own highest sensibilities, to bring this person back to some agreed upon standard of conduct. When we're partnered with one another in our tradition, we're to receive one another as gifts of God, and not just any gift of God. Your partner is a son or daughter of the king, created in the image of God. If they're a Christian, it gets even bigger that this is someone filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. This is not just any person that you can speak roughly to, that you can mumble against. You're in the presence of someone who is particularly rare and particularly fine. We also remember that these people with whom we're connected are people for whom we have responsibility and for whose care we are accountable, that the office of stewardship kicks in here, that I believe that on the last day, God is going to ask you about the, your stewarding of your partner's life and gifts. Not that you're completely responsible for everything that he or she does. Please don't make this into a caricature. But did you do everything you could do to bring out the grace and goodness that God put in that person? Did you make their path easier? Did you use your strength and your gifts to encourage them? 
I think that that's something that we always remember. And then Jesus' command is on point, that we're not to judge the servants of another master. You understand that. You are not the master of your spouse. You are not the final arbiter about whether or not they are succeeding or failing in this life. They are the servants, the slaves of Jesus, just as you are. And finally, it's up to Jesus to decide whether or not they conducted themselves well whether or not they lived in a holy manner. So stay in your lane, cultivate a spirit of gentleness, cultivate a spirit of grace, be a steward of your spouse. And most of these temptations to idolatry are diminished. Oh, there's one more thing to, to think about here. Uh, my, one of my teachers, Anthony DeMello, a, a tremendous gift to me. Uh, DeMello talks about that we ought learn to cling lightly to one another. I, I like those words together. Clinging, of course, is, is this desperate sort of embrace, but lightly. And his image that he uses uh, for the human life is that we have all been pitched off a precipice. We are all falling and the bottom will come for us sooner or later. But that the bottom is uneven and it comes for some of us before it comes for others. And if we cling too tightly to any other person or any other thing, when it hits the bottom, we risk being shattered. And so his prescription for us is that we are always aware that each day we have is a day of grace, a day of gift, a day that God has allowed us to have, that every connection we have is precious and is to be savored, to be clung to, but our clinging should be light lest we be shattered and that we always remember that each moment is precious. We remember to enjoy each moment, to be grateful for each gift. And finally, when the end comes for us or for our beloved, we trust that God's grace will cover that too. And that if it falls to you to go on without your partner, God will provide for you. If it falls for you or your partner to go on without you, that you will enter grace and your partner will continue to walk in this world with Jesus. There was a comment that came in about images uh, and an understanding uh, why the Jewish, uh, the Jewish faith or the Muslim faith uh, doesn't have drawings or representations of living things in their places of worship. Um, but this person was aware that different churches seem to have different relationships with sacred art or with statuary or with icons. And that there are some churches, particularly the Eastern Orthodox churches, where it doesn't seem to collapse into idolatry, at least not in this person's experience, that, that the Eastern Orthodox do a very good job of using sacred art as a teaching medium for other people. And if that's true broadly, God bless the Eastern Orthodox. If it's true in the, in the places where you've seen God bless those priests and those people who are making that happen, because of course that is the goal. That sacred art, right, statuary, paintings, stained glass are supposed to be a teaching aid for children and for the illiterate. They're not supposed to be substitute objects of our veneration or of our awe. They're supposed to point us to God not be the thing that we revere in place of God. In our tradition, in the Lutheran tradition, we are very cautious about sacred art. Now, we do have stained glass in a lot of our churches, and in a lot of that stained glass, it's the, the, the main stories, usually of the Old Testament, on one side of the building and the New Testament on the other, so that someone coming in who did not know the written word of God would be able to learn the stories in the, same, in the stained glass and to grasp God's saving enterprise. That's the hope. But otherwise, we don't have a lot of sacred art. Uh, our, our gravity has tended to, to orbit, or we've tended to orbit around music and hymnody. And we, our experience is that there's less opportunity there to make of those things an idol, although it is certainly possible 
to make our culture and our sensibilities, our hymnody and our way of speaking into an idol. That if you would be a Christian, you must sing like us, talk like us, pray like us, eat like us. The beautiful thing, of course, is that once this is clearly expressed to most Lutherans, right, is children of the Heavenly Father and potato sausage really your God? Most of us smile with a good deal of grace. We shuffle our feet for a while, and then we try to do better. But yes, some churches do better than other churches. We are aware of the pitfalls of sacred art. Perhaps we've overcorrected. Something for us to think about. All right. Uh, someone says um, they get when I we talked about this uh, this thing that's added to the first commandment, that if you reject God, uh, that your children's children, the third and fourth generation, will, will suffer the consequences. And for those who love God, uh, there'll be blessing to the thousandth generation. And so someone wrote in to say, okay, I get that. And I, I understand your examples. I talked about, you know, if, if a parent uses drugs, um, the kids are going to pay the price, right? That that's just the way the world is, that God isn't going out of God's way here to be particularly difficult or obstreperous with us. Uh, that at a certain point, uh, walking into the dark means that those who follow you or who come from you are born and live in the dark, right? Uh, and so uh, this person said they, they understood that, but God must allow those children the opportunity for redemption, right? Absolutely, or there'd be no hope for any of us. That, that God continues to call each generation, each person, each man, each woman, and to offer them a path into light and wholeness and peace. But it's still true that my grandchildren will pay for my sins. Again, those born in the dark live in the dark. And I pray that God will rescue them from my brokenness. I pray that God will guide their steps into the light. But there will still be marks. There will still be chains that they, cooperating with God's spirit, will need to break. My prayer for my children and for my grandchildren is that they'd be better people than I am, that they'd go further into love and honor and service of God than I ever have. And I am aware when tempted and aware when in sin that I am not the only person who will pay for this misconduct. That's just the way the world is. But yes, God is graceful and his mercy knows no ends. And my children and my grandchildren will have the opportunity to live lives of obedient service. Thanks be to God. There was a question, uh, Luther believed, this is the, the, the words that were written in, Luther believed we could worship another God, for instance, Buddha, to bring us peace, but ultimately only the one true God comes first. Correct? Worship? No. That we are not to worship any other God any other representation of a God, any other image of anything that is above the earth, on the earth, or under the earth. And Buddha certainly qualifies there. It's ultimately only God that can be worshiped. But learn? Sure. You can learn from Buddha. Buddha was an incredibly smart guy. And it's an interesting question because of what the Buddha taught and how the Buddha taught it. Right? We believe in, I don't know enough about the Eastern Church to make it universal, but in the Western Church, we believe that all truth comes from the Holy Spirit. All truth. Mathematical truth. Scientific truth. Truths that you find in literature or in poetry or in art in other philosophies, even in other religions. If you find something true, you are looking at the fingerprints of the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That that spirit is truth. Jesus is truth. The Father is truth. And if you find truth, God has been there. But 
We think Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God and the final and highest revelation possible for us to comprehend, that, that we can't see God as God exists in this Trinity, this mutual indwelling. But we do see Jesus, and in Jesus, we hear the promise, the Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we can't imagine that there'd be anything higher than that. But as long as Buddha wants to walk in Jesus' world, as long as what you're learning from the Buddha or from any other philosophy or any other discipline, any other author or poet doesn't interfere with the Lordship of Jesus Christ, doesn't make claims to rival the Lordship of Jesus Christ, doesn't attempt to unseat Jesus from his throne, have at it, be my guest. Now, regarding the Buddha in particular, there is an awful lot for us to learn, right? There are things that, that Buddhists have practiced that we have let slip, that our, Buddhists, our Buddhist neighbors have a sense of what's possible in terms of disciplining a human body. That for those of us who eternally have the fidgets and can't imagine sitting still for five minutes to pray, can't imagine kneeling to pray because our knees would hurt. Can't imagine carving out a time of stillness and silence to contemplate the mysteries and the wonders of God. We have a lot to learn there. The Buddhists also have practiced disciplining their minds in a way that most of us don't even imagine. The Buddha said that the untrained mind was like a drunken monkey bouncing from one thing to the next. Well, I think that's just true. I think that's demonstrably true. If I ask you not to think about a pink squirrel eating a jelly sandwich, how long can you go not thinking about said squirrel, said sandwich? You have no abilities to do that at all. And of course, were you to develop some of those disciplines and some of those mental abilities that you could focus in on the claims that are made about Jesus, claims that we have discussed for this coming week, that Jesus is the door, that he is the gate, that he's the great protector of the sheep, that he is the great I am, he is God come to redeem and to call and protect us. If you could focus on that, how much would you grow how much would your faith increase? How much finer would subsequent service be? The power of awareness is something that we can learn from our Buddhist neighbors. A, a worldview that's a worldview that's very clear that stuff can't make you happy. And then the Buddha's own testimony. Right? Someone once asked him, "What are you anyway? Are you a god? Nope. Are you an angel? Nope." Well, then what are you? I'm awake. It's all he ever claimed for himself. There's a beauty in that, that when people would see us as more than we are or higher than we are, that we would be very clear about what and who we are. So learn everywhere and everything you can. Follow truth. Embrace truth. If Jesus is the truth, if you're following the truth, sooner or later, you are going to wind up in Jesus' arms. So love the truth. Pursue it. Make it part of your soul. The last thing to say about the Buddhists, of course, is that they're in the middle of a fight that's pretty amusing to some of us. Right? There are a whole bunch of American Buddhists uh, that drive the world's Buddhists crazy because they always t they are want to speak of their Buddha nature. Right? My Buddha nature allows me to do this. My inner Buddha says that this is okay for me. My inner Buddha gives me peace about this. And the world's Buddhists say, what are you talking about? There's only the Buddha of the texts. You can't just make stuff up and attribute it to some fancy, passing fancy that you have or some emotional turmoil that you have. That's not how it works. And if you wanted to learn from that conversation that Jesus isn't whoever you want Jesus to be, he isn't whoever I want him to be, he is who he is, the blessed God the Son, that would be a good use of your time and a fruitful conversation with the Buddhists. Should we worship anything but God? No. Should we learn? Sure. We're created in the image of God. Learning is part of who we are. 
someone wrote in uh, that we can never get away from having idols and, and that, that she found some comfort in, in me saying that, that idols just spontaneously generate themselves for us uh, and that we are always tempted and, and led astray. Uh, that's right. And so we're going to get to it. But when Luther talks about what baptism is and what it means, he talks about a daily drowning to sin, a daily death, and then a subsequent resurrection and repentance. That, that we are broken and weak, and we need a redeemer. And the idols will continue to call and will continue to look. But Jesus has you. And Jesus isn't going to let you go. Someone, uh, someone wrote in that comparing ourselves to others uh, isn't only idolatry. We talked about that already today. But it's also stupid. This person didn't use the word stupid. They're much nicer than I am. Uh, but it's also stupid because we can't know the other person's struggles, their heart, their weaknesses. We don't know how someone else is doing given the hands that they've been dealt. It reminded me of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis talks about we might think we're very fine people because we're friendly and kind and gracious to people uh, in all of our walks of life. Uh, and we judge that man over there who does less well than we, who is less gracious than we. And Luther, or Luther, Lewis posits, maybe he has bad teeth. Maybe he lives in constant anguish that every breath hurts him. Now, given that information, are you doing as well as he's doing? It's the right question. I don't know the gifts you have, the temptations you have, the struggles you have, and you don't know those things about me. Today, you and I are both called into a relationship of grace and peace with Jesus. We're called to walk the steps that he shows us, to use the gifts that he's given us, and finally, he will judge me, and only he will judge you. There was uh, someone who, uh, who wanted to talk, uh, a couple, who wanted to talk about Exodus 32. Remember, at the very end, I said that the beauty of the Catechism is that it distills and concentrates the messages of the Bible, and then it leads us back into the Bible, right? That the stories of the Bible begin to remind us of parts of the Catechism, and the Catechism reminds us of stories that we need to know and remember for our amendment of life or for our blessing. And Exodus 32 was one of the things that I suggested. Uh, this is the story of the, the people of Israel making the golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain. And uh, people wrote in uh, remembering how quickly it seems that Israel turned that God had led them out of Egypt, had done all of the, the mighty acts in Egypt, had led them out, had opened the Red Sea, had provided for them in the wilderness, uh, had, had, was, was in their presence as a sign on the mountain with, with cloud and thunder and lightning. And still they forgot and went to work worshiping a golden calf during the 40 days that Moses was up getting the law from God. And this person, uh, God bless her, uh, said that the, the temptation, of course, is to judge Israel. You know, how can you receive so much and still plunge so willingly into sin? But that's us. Exodus 32 is not a story that we have in order to condemn Israel. It's a, it's a cautionary tale for us that this is what we are inclined to do. This is the level of our brokenness, the level of our stupidity, the level of our ingratitude. That having received so much grace upon grace, miracle after miracle, the gift of the life of Jesus himself, we still wander away into darkness and foolishness. Thanks be to God that Jesus continues to be our shepherd to call our names and to lead us back into provision and protection. Finally, there was someone who wondered about Moses smashing the Ten Commandments there in Exodus 32. Uh, you remember Moses comes down the mountain, he sees the people cavorting and misbehaving uh, around, uh, around the golden calf, and, and in anger he smashes the tablets. And someone wondered, you know, was that the right thing to do? I mean, those were tablets upon which God had written the, the, the laws that would give structure and shape to a peaceful community. And was Moses wrong to do that? 
let's remember that Moses had an anger problem. And there's no way you can read the stories of Moses without coming to that. That when you read about Moses, you're reading about a human being who has been called by God into service. And one of the things I love about the scriptures is that it doesn't clean up our heroes. It doesn't clean up Samson. It doesn't clean up David. It doesn't clean up Moses. These are people who made profound mistakes. And if you have an hour, read the Abraham cycle and you'll be amazed at some of the mistakes he makes. This is a true story of God shutting himself up into a room with a group of people that he is determined to save. And their brokenness will not be the end of the story. Moses had an anger problem. He killed an Egyptian taskmaster in a fit of rage, leading to his exile. He smashed the tablets that had been written by God's own hand. Later on, God tells him to provide water uh, to the people, and he, he hits the rock with his stick in a fit of pick. And he pays the price for that, that he's not allowed to enter the promised land. He's still beloved of God, right? He still is shown the promised land. He still leads God's people. When he dies, he's buried by God's own hand. Thousands of years later, he is a revered figure in three major world religions, but he had an anger problem. And there are consequences to our sin. I'm redeemed of God. I have a future in the kingdom of light. But my sin matters. My brokenness has consequences for me, for my family, for the churches that have called me, for you. I'm not the teacher I should be. I'm not the helper that you may need. Thanks be to God that God uses broken people like me and like you, like Moses and Abraham and Samson and David, and that through us, his work progresses. I'm so grateful for these times where we talk together and think together, pray together and love one another. I invite you to continue uh, to, to listen and to respond. And I invite you to listen for the voice of Jesus and to follow him. God is God. There is only one. There is no other. And Jesus is God come to set you free. We pray and we remember and we think in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bye now.